Perfect. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, today we have, uh, it's hot off the presses, we have Dr. Johnson, Dr. Mullane, and Dr. Lynn participating. Uh, and Dr. Johnson is going to be the star of the show since we have the pediatric vaccine <laughs> out and there's a great deal of enthusiasm among the, amongst the enthused for getting vaccinated. So we're gonna have our questions answered. Um, the other issue that's going on is if you've been outside and you didn't wear a coat, it's cold. Uh, and cold means uh, the frolicking of summer is over and we're gonna be indoors and we expect uh, not such great things in the winter time, not as horrible as last winter, but not as uh, wonderful as we had hoped. So I just wanted to go over what's going on with the um, Chicago dashboard. And then uh, I was gonna put out some data from the uh, IHME, which is the Institute of he Health Metrics, which has been spot on actually in, in going about where the uh, pandemic has been going. They've been very good at uh, University of Washington. And so I wanted to go over that data. So this is the Chicago dashboard. Um, can you make it a full screen here, Megan? Make it full screen. So it's not. So the whole, so we're not doing the, there you go, from the beginning. Okay, go to the next slide. Perfect. And then the next slide. Okay, so you can see, oh, we'll go to the first, that previous slide. There we go. You can see that the positivity rate hovers under 1%. Last week, it was 1.6%. It's 1.7%. The number of deaths has dropped dramatically, but still are occurring. Uh, the hospitalizations are uh, 0.5 per 100,000, and the current daily average is around 13 hospitalizations. Uh, it was 18 the prior week. Uh, and the number of tests are decreasing. And all of these are very, very good numbers. Not great numbers, but very good numbers. Um, this is not the same picture everywhere. Uh, next slide. You can see the COVID case rates remain higher amongst unvaccinated individuals as compared to fully vaccinated Chicagoans. Uh, and this is all from Chicago Han. You can go on the website and find it. Um, the, the rate per um, 100,000 you can see is for, for the, the red is the unvaccinated is about 170 per 100,000. And for the fully vaccinated is, is holding steady around 50 and falling. So if you're vaccinated, you're better off. And it's basically test positivity. Next, next slide. And then hospitalizations are significantly higher for unvaccinated versus vaccinated. Uh, next slide. And, and the proof of the pudding that vaccines continue to work show that the fully vaccinated have a, a very low death rate. The, vaccine, the unvaccinated after spiking in September still are, are, are dying at what has been historically around one and a half to two percent, which is still way too high for this country. Next slide. So that shows you that vaccines do work. And this is the more troubling data in Chicago. You can see where the hotspots are. Um, and that 60631, 60646, those areas are traditionally where um, the firefighters, the police folks are uh, on the north side. And then, and then you can see about, out by downtown area. Next slide. And then far south side, uh, you can see where the hot spots are for, from as far as the positivity rate. So the rest of Chicago is actually doing okay. It's these localized hot spots that are causing some of most of the issues. And if your hospital is in that area, and we go to hospitals in those areas, the rates are significantly higher than the city hospitals that, that we also service. Go to the next slide. Next slide, Megan. So this is the worldwide data, and it's really disturbing. You can see the north-south divide on this. And in fact, if you looked at it today, Russia would be the same color as Mongolia, as the same color as it, it's really, Russia is now a level five travel, means you should not go there um, because of how high the tr um, transmission rates are in Russia. The same thing goes for Romania, um, Ukraine, uh, Bulgaria, and, and, and um, Estonia. Th these countries are suffering from a pretty big outbreak right now. And the B Bulgarian vaccination rate is about 28%. Um, and, they're, and they're not able to get their citizenry to get vaccinated. And then if you go to countries that are warmer, okay, uh, India, 
India does not have a, India is a level two for travel. Uh, the rates are much lower than the United States right now. Uh, and so you can see that they're having some level of immunity. A recent study shows that with natural immunity, you get about 16 months of protection at best. Um, and so after that, they expect the rates to go back up unless you get everyone vaccinated. So the United States is having its own problems. Uh, and, 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 and thankfully now in Argentina and Chile, uh, the, the summer is upon them. Their weather is better and, and, and they've had, unfortunately, been through a lot of uh, <clears throat> natural infection. Uh, next, next slide. And the population where people are vaccinated uh, is at least one dose of vaccine. About half of the world has gotten about one dose of vaccine, except Africa. Africa is woefully under vaccinated. Uh, and, and, you know, mainland China, India, they're catching up. Unfortunately, the United States has stagnated. We're stuck in the 60s and we're not able to get beyond the 60s and we've fallen behind a lot of the other countries. The disturbing part about the uh, next slide, go to the next slide. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't have a slide. <laughs> go, go back one more slide. So I don't, I, I forgot to put the slide in, but Germany is having its own positive pos um, problems with people now with breakthrough infections, the same as UK. And the interesting part about that is uh, the restriction, the Boris Johnson and company in the UK, despite having a fairly high vaccination rates, have decided to open up their country, no masks, you can go into the pubs, you can do what you like to do, and this has resulted in significant positivity. It has not strained the, hos the hospitalizations as much, but people are getting sick, and then all the consequences of long COVID. Uh, next slide. So this is from the New York Times, rates of vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals, you can see for the United States, uh, fully vaccinated, you have about a uh, average daily cases, you have about six times as high if you're unvaccinated, and then average daily deaths about 12 times as high if you're unvaccinated. Next slide. And, and the areas are also, Alaska is in the midst of a, ma a major outbreak right now, but you can see that the South has dropped significantly, and, and it's not because they have high vaccination rates. They've had a significant um, natural infection rates that they've suffered from and the mortality rates that have subsequently followed in Florida, Mississippi, Alabama, and Texas. Uh, but the weather has gotten better, so they're okay for now. Um, Northeast is, is climbing back up and, and the Midwest is climbing back up simply because uh, I think the vaccination rates have stagnated and now we have uh, the cold weather upon us. Next slide. And the daily trends have remained uh, stable. We're having uh, well, well over um, uh, 100, right under um, 100,000 cases reported in hospitalizations. We've stabilized uh, over, what is it, about 50,000 hospitalizations um, a day. Next slide, in the last 90 days. And the death rate, unfortunately, we're, we're, we're stuck at around 1,000 plus people dying uh, every day in the United States, which is, We've kind of gotten used to that figure, which is very bothersome because uh, you got as high as 3,000. So we go, oh, my God, we are less than 3,000. That's good. It is not good. We're losing, you know, the equivalent. Right now, we've lost the equivalent to the city of Denver in this country, 700,000 people. Uh, and we're on track to continue to lose over 1,000 people a day based on projections. Next slide. So this is from the Institute of Health Metrics, I would IHME, I would suggest everyone go to their website because they do a really good job in um, projections. And they've been spot on from the beginning of the pandemic through. Um, and, and this is the worst case scenario on top up here. If there's no masking and no social distancing, this is the best case scenario if everybody masked and socially distanced. But this is what they project will like. This is the reported and this is what they think is the actual case. So you're going to see uh, in, in cumulative daily deaths, okay? Currently, this is where we're at. We're about, reported about 1,500 deaths a day. They think this is gonna dip as we get into November, uh, through November, and then stabilize well over 1,000 deaths a day through February 22nd and beyond. So this is not going to be easy. We're gonna sig have significant amount of deaths in this country. Next slide. And um, this is, Cumulative deaths, if everything goes according to projections, and they've been pretty good, and this is the reported deaths and what they really think is the death rate, you're, you're talking about by February 22nd, okay, by February 22nd, the best case scenario 
is going to be about 750,000 deaths. And the worst case scenarios go over a million, but they project that it's probably going to be somewhere south of uh, over, right over 750,000. And, and, and it's, these are really daunting statistics and they've been right. And, and, and you know, we have to try to mitigate some of this. Next slide. So what does all this mean? The vaccination doesn't prevent infection. I think this has been one of the failures of communication. These vaccines are really, really good vaccines. They work really well, but they don't prevent infection. And, and nasal mRNA vaccine, mRNA infections are, RNA infections are very difficult to, to prevent uh, with vaccination, but they do prevent death. Masking works, but it's not perfect, but it works to a degree. So masking should be continued. And a balance has to be struck between opening up the economy and the risk of spread. And this is really the message that's going to be out there. The winter will be long and the rates will vary. And, and the factors that are going to drive this is, is there still going to be masking? Is there going to be enough increase in vaccine uptake with the new children's vaccine? And, and are people going to continue to follow the rules? Or as if you could see recently in polling data, as well as the uh, uh, election results, people are upset with, with not having enough quote unquote freedom. Um, and I will leave this next part up to Dr. Johnson to talk about the new vaccines. So, Dan, you're on. Great. Thank you, uh, Vishnu. Appreciate that. Uh, it's a sad story that you've told. And, you know, the big take home point is that uh, people kind of had a choice. They could either get immunity from vaccine or they could get immunity from, uh, from natural infection. Unfortunately, too many people have selected natural infection, which means then that a uh, much larger percentage of people have died. I mean, you look at the number of people that have died from uh, the vaccine, and you can argue that it's about three. Uh, and you foretold uh, a, a sad future of 800,000 deaths uh, or narrowing in 800,000 deaths in the US. So let's talk about something much more cheerful, uh, which is COVID vaccine for five to 11 year olds. Next slide. Uh, and I think the first place to start here uh, is the, to do a, a quick comparison. Uh, you know, the purple cap is the vaccine that's been available uh, through Pfizer 12 years and up. Uh, it's a 30 microgram dose. You inject uh, 0 0.3 ml, uh, you dilute it with 1.8 ml when you get the bottle, uh, and that bottle produces six doses, and it holds well in the freezer, uh, as long as it's an ultra-cold freezer, uh, gives you a couple of weeks in a regular freezer, uh, and you get a month uh, in the refrigerator. Uh, that's comparison to the now new vaccine, which is for five to uh, less than 12, or we'll call it five to 11. Uh, the dose is different, 10 micrograms instead of 30, so it's one third the dose. The volume injected is different, 0 0.2 ml. The uh, volume that you use to dilute it, 1.3 ml, that buys you 10 doses per vial, uh, it uh, holds less time in the freezer, but look at that time in the refrigerator, 10 weeks. Impressive. But the reason why I go through this is because it's important that your staff get educated because you cannot give the purple vaccine, the purple cap vaccine to children five to 11. Can't do that you give them the new vaccine and it's different strength, different dilution, different dose. So your staff really need to be trained on how to manage this. Now, there is some good news next, which is there's gonna be a gray top. You know, so now you gotta learn purple, gray, and orange. Uh, the gray top will come out uh, in the coming weeks uh, Pfizer said they just wanted to roll out the pediatric vaccine. The gray top, you won't have to dilute. It, it'll still be the 0.3 ml, uh, but it'll have the uh, storage characteristics of the orange top. So this is good news for 
for offices because you'll be able to even more easily manage Pfizer vaccine uh, in your uh, uh, location. And the other thing that is worth pointing out is that the orange top is going to be 12 hours. So it should say that can be sued up to 12 hours, can be used up to 12 hours. Sorry, I missed that misspelling. <laughs> Um, so uh, you can be sued forever, <laughs> but, uh, but you can use this uh, for 12 hours after you've diluted it. So really, it's, it's going to be a much easier vaccine for your staff to handle. But they, they really have to be clear about this in terms of recognizing the difference. Uh, and it's not going to just be that uh, the orange top uh, will be orange, but rather there'll be stripes on the bottle. Uh, so that way, even when the top is taken off, you'll know uh, that it is the uh, orange vial for kids. Next slide. All right. So this is going to come to you in uh, vials uh, of 10 per carton. So you'll be able to get 100 doses. Uh, and uh, I think really uh, I've covered uh, the rest of this sufficiently. So we'll move on to the, to the next thing. Oh, one thing I do want to mention, very important. The dilution, uh, the diluent for the vaccine will be shipped with the vaccine. The bottles will contain 10 ml of diluent. But as I mentioned, you only use 1.3 ml. You are not to repeatedly puncture the diluent bottle. So you will use the 1.3 ml, and then you will toss the diluent. Just throw the vial away, because you're not. It is not a vial that can be repeatedly entered, uh, and so it's very important that your staff uh, understand that. Uh, and um, next slide. So how do we know that this vaccine? works? How do we know that the vaccine is safe? Well, you know, it's uh, data that's been generated uh, based off of two cohorts uh, in a single trial uh, that gave uh, 3,000 kids aged 5 to 11 reasonably well distributed amongst the ages uh, uh, and compared them to the placebo group that was about 1,500 uh, placebo recipients. Now, it was two different cohorts. Cohort one was set up when there was anticipation that uh, the FDA uh, would only want about 1,500 individuals vaccinated. Uh, but they asked for additional safety data. Uh, and so that led to the generation of a second cohort, which was the same size. Cohort one also generated the immunogenicity data, whereas cohort two did not. Uh, the doses were two doses. Uh, as I'm sure all of you know, uh, given three weeks apart. So single dose, wait three weeks, next dose, just like with adults. Next slide. So how are these uh, populations distributed? A little bit about the demographics. This is the data from cohort one. It's nearly identical to cohort two. Uh, so first you can see that it was a pretty even distribution, male, female. Next. Uh, next, what I hope you can see uh, is that, uh, if you could hit next one more time, there you go. Uh, you'll see that uh, the distribution uh, by race and ethnicity pretty much reflected the US. Some people would argue that uh, the number of uh, Black or African Americans that were enrolled uh, certainly would have been nice if it was higher. Uh, it does represent uh, more or less the US population, but it's a little bit on the low side. Uh, those with uh, Latinx origin was 21%. That seems to be a pretty reasonable number. Uh, next, the other thing to point out is comorbidities. Uh, uh, there was about 20% of the population, 21%, uh, had comorbidities. About half of the comorbidities was obesity. Uh, the other half were the kinds of comorbidities that those of us who take care of children frequently see, uh, asthma, diabetes, 
uh, being uh, top of the list. Uh, neurologic, neurodegenerative uh, uh, diseases. Uh, so uh, those were the kinds of things that you would see. And then last, next, uh, is that 70%, 71% of the population came from the United States. You can see that other countries involved include Finland, Poland, and Spain. Next. So this is the immunogenicity data. And the important thing to, to see here is that the level of antibody generated by this study is impressive. You gotta remember, it was one third the dose that was given to these kids five to 11 years old. And they all had the same immune response. Uh, and that immune response was equivalent to what you see with the 16 to 25 year olds. And you know from prior data, the 16 to 25 year olds had even a higher level of antibody than what adults generated from the same uh, vaccine, uh, indicating the, uh, a impressive antibody response. The other thing that was impressive is the table below, which shows the percentage that had a, a seropositive or sero response, 99%, very impressive. The other thing that's uh, reassuring is that they looked at a group of patients, only 10, uh, but that's enough. And they looked at their in vitro neutralization. And Delta was neutralized just as effectively as the original version of virus that entered the US, which is the USA Washington uh, 1 slash 2020. Uh, so suggesting then that neutralization uh, against Delta is every bit as good as neutralization against the other version of the virus. Next slide. What about efficacy uh, in terms of at least outcome in the population? Well, again, it's 3,000 patients compared to 1,500. So your confidence intervals are going to be relatively wide, as you can see there. But it did show a 91% efficacy, which is what it did in the adult vaccine. And again, remember, one third the dose, telling us then uh, that uh, they picked a very good dose uh, for kids. Uh, and one of the big questions that I've been getting from people over and over again is, well, what do I do if they're 11 and they're about to turn 12? Uh, and what do I do if the five to 11 year old is the size of a 12 year old? Uh, and the answer is, this is all about immunity. We don't dose vaccines, generally speaking, based on weight. We do it based on the maturity of the immune system. And if you think about children and their immune system, it's kind of zero to two, two to five, five to 11, 12 and up. Uh, and that's the reason why they looked at this dosing in those age groups and continue to look at it in the younger age groups so it's all about the age of the patient at the time the needle enters their arm. And you can, of course, argue there's no real difference between someone who's uh, 12 minus one week and 12 plus one week. And you'd be right. But you got to have a cutoff somewhere. Uh, and that's the cutoff. Next slide. Now, safety was looked at. And of course, they looked at uh, local reactions. Uh, as well as systemic uh, side effects. Uh, for lymphadenopathy, just to move that out of the way, it was less than 1%. Um, myocarditis and pericarditis, we'll talk about in a little more detail. It wasn't seen, but we'll talk about it in a little more detail. Neither were any of the other findings there. But we expect these to be rare. So the study wasn't exactly powered to really see all of the rarest events. Next slide. So what were the common side effects? Well, like the adult, your arm hurts, small percentage, get some fever, feel kind of tired, get some headache. Next slide. Those symptoms only lasted for 48 to 72 hours, easily managed with acetaminophen uh, and or ibuprofen. I think here's some interesting data. The first is, is there were a little, little more reacted, uh, reactogenicity locally compared to the dose used in 16 to 25 year olds, okay? So 
their arms uh, hurt. Um, uh, they got a little red and they got a little swollen, but pretty low occurrence. Next slide. Here's really the most interesting data, which is the systemic side effects just almost in many ways weren't there. Look at the data. It was about half to one third in the five to 11 year olds compared to the 16 to 26 year olds. That's impressive. But I think even more impressive is it was the same as the placebo. Making one think that the vaccine in the five to 11 year olds just doesn't generate systemic side effects. Placebo is the lower half. The Pfizer is the upper half of the, of the slide. Look at that, fatigue, the same. Headaches, the same. Chills, the same. You just read it all the way across the board. It's the same placebo versus vaccine. Suggesting then that you get a great immune response, but you aren't really paying a price in terms of uh, forcing people to have systemic side effects. Next slide. Myocarditis, pericarditis. Well, it wasn't powered to tell us that. There weren't any cases. So right now, zero per 3,000. It's a lousy batting average if you're coming up to the plate, uh, but you know it's a great outcome for uh, the systemic side effects. Now, why is it important to do some educated guessing about what the incidence of myocarditis and pericarditis is? Well, it has to do with the fact that you're trying to think about risk benefit with the data that we have. So what the CDC, FDA, and the company did was they decided to do an analysis making an assumption about myocarditis and pericarditis. And how did they make that decision? Well, they looked at the 12 to 17 year olds. And they said, well, we'll look at the VAERS data. We'll look at Optum Healthcare Claims Database. Now the Optum data is worse than anybody else's. Showed 200 cases per million, about one in 5,000. VAERS data is less than that. Uh, and that's kind of surprising because usually the VAERS data is over subscribed in terms of side effects, not under. So the fact uh, is that when they did the analysis, they decided to use the optimum worst, worst case scenario for the analysis. Now, the other thing that I wanna point out is that when you look at the incidence of myocarditis, pericarditis after infection with people, generally speaking, people 12 to 25 year olds have the worst incidence of myocarditis, pericarditis. People younger, much less, people older, less. So again, it's the worst case scenario for myocarditis, pericarditis. Next slide. So you gotta ask yourselves, is it worth doing? So they generated six scenarios. These scenarios all were different based on incidence of COVID-19 in the population. So that way you could begin to estimate how much protection there would be. Scenario number three is the, when there was the lowest recorded incidence during the pandemic, which was June of 2021. Well, Dr. Chundi presented to us, of course, data that shows that it's much higher. So we're closer to scenarios one, two, four, and five, and six in terms of incidence. So just remember scenario three lowest, everything else about the same in terms of incidence, and then some minor changes in terms of thinking about risk of myocarditis, pericarditis, with scenario six using a 50% of the scenario uh, one's rate of myocarditis, pericarditis. And they did that because that's probably closer to what we might expect in reality to see. So let's go to the next slide. 
So here's a chart. Benefit on the left, risk on the right. Benefits have to do with prevented cases. You can see it's an impressive number, except for scenario three, when the incidence really shrinks in the population uh, of COVID circulating. Prevented hospitalizations for kids, you know, it's a relatively rare event. It's about half a percent to 1% occurrence. So that's why the numbers that are, are there. Prevented uh, admissions, prevented deaths. Excess myocarditis, remember, scenarios one through five, worst case. Scenario number six, probably closer to what we might see. So when you do the comparisons, you can begin to see why it is that the FDA, the CDC, and ASEP said, let's do this. They're talking about the worst case. Remember, there are worse things that happen to people who get COVID compared to the people who get the vaccine, right? You get long hauler, four to eight percent of children get long haul. Myocarditis with uh, infection from SARS-CoV-2 in children, about 1%. So we're, we're talking about uh, uh, serious problems uh, beyond just hospitalizations and ICU admissions. Next slide. And then remember, the vaccine does a better job than natural infection in protecting people. 42% of kids in this age group have been infected if you look at zero data. But you still want to vaccinate them all because you're going to increase their protection. Next slide. So what's the bottom line here? We got a lot of kids out there. They do get sick from COVID. They do get hospitalized. Sadly, some of them die. They get other long-term problems. This virus is never going away. Maybe new treatments will appear. Maybe that'll change the equation. But until the rate of COVID drops to what has been a historic low, which ain't gonna happen in our state probably until May or June, we gotta protect our kids. And that's why, next slide, it makes good clinical sense to vaccinate these kids five to 11. Next slide. So if you wanna get some help with training, you, CDPH has a lot of stuff online. Next slide. There's some tips and tricks, tricks to help kids uh, get through the needle stick. Also online through CDPH. Next slide. There's some education videos that you can use both for families and yourself. Next slide. Uh, and there's just a lot of stuff available to help you make your way towards the changes you have to make in order to be able to immunize the five to 11 year olds. Next slide. Uh, and then if you want some help around billing, um, here it is, but of course the vaccine is free, but you'll get information about how you get some reimbursement uh, through billing. Next slide. Uh, so here's just some advice in terms of what to do to prepare your staff for the rollout. Uh, really the most important thing is to make sure they understand the difference between the vials. Uh, at our place, we've created some orange stickers and some purple stickers that go on the syringes. So that way we can make sure that they always know which syringe is purple and which syringe is orange uh, to make sure that everybody knows what they're doing. Next slide. I think this was my last one. Oh, I just want to mention there's a, a project that the Illinois chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics is doing with the uh, Illinois um, Association of, of uh, Family uh, uh, Practice. I think IAFP uh, and, uh, and also with ECHO Chicago, uh, uh, you know, my organization. Uh, and uh, we're 
helping to train sites, not just on the PEDS vaccine, but also on the adult vaccine. Uh, it's statewide uh, and uh, we're rolling out training in December uh, and uh, ongoing training uh, for the rest of the year to try and help practices surmount any of their challenges around vaccination. Thank you, the Illinois Academy. Sorry, I blew that, uh, of family physicians. Thank you. All right, that was my last slide. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to turn things over to Ed Lynn. Ed? Oh, thank you, Dan. <clears throat> uh, again, I would like to uh, thank everyone who in attendance. Uh, and I'm going to be speaking to you now about women's issues. Um, you know, specifically a reproductive age population. In addition to being a trustee of the Medical Society and, and involved with the COVID-19 task force, I'm also an OBGYN. And uh, I just want to share with you uh, uh, some information because um, uh, we as a nation are not doing a very good job of vaccinating pregnant women. May I have the next slide, please? Uh, these are the general recommendations and consideration uh, from the American College of OBGYN. Now, uh, this came out uh, a few weeks ago. I put the slide together a few days ago and already it's out of date in that now we're talking as uh, Dr. Johnson pointed out, uh, the vaccines are now available to all people uh, at a younger age than 12. And um, we're asking all uh, providers uh, who take care of reproductive age women to encourage them uh, as ACOG says, strongly recommend that all eligible persons receive the COVID-19 vaccine uh, or again, the vaccine series. May I have the next slide, please? And the reason we're talking about this and the reason we're concerned, um, people may be aware in the audience that uh, roughly, uh, and this came out at the end of August, uh, about 30, 31% of pregnant women uh, in the United States were vaccinated at that time. Uh, I'm hoping it's much higher, but I don't think it is uh, as I'm speaking to you now early in November. Um, and that's because the available data suggests that the symptomatic pregnant women and recently pregnant patients with COVID are an increased risk for more severe illness compared with uh, non-pregnant peers. And even though the absolute risk for a severe infection is low, uh, the data shows that there is an increased risk of ICU admissions leading to mechanical ventilation, ven ventilatory support in the form of ECMO, and unfortunately death. And these have all been described uh, when you compare symptomatic women to um, symptomatic non-pregnant women. Clearly, there's a large group of uh, people who, uh, quote unquote, have the infection because they have a positive test, but do not manifest symptoms. And that's uh, a group that we think um, is uh, dealing with this infection in, in a different way. We're talking now about symptomatic, people that become sick. Um, pregnant and recently pregnant patients uh, with comorbidities such as obesity and diabetes may even be at a greater risk uh, of severe illness compared to the general population with uh, similar comorbidities. So I want you to pause for a moment and, and, and reflect on this. If I was talking about influenza, uh, we would be having the same discussion. Uh, pregnant women who get influenza tend to be more ill than non-pregnant women. Pregnancy in itself may be in some ways an immunoparalytic state and uh, women do not fight off infections as easily as in the non-pregnant state. And we can go on about urinary tract infection and continue uh, the entire list. And it's something to keep in mind. And one of the reasons why we're urging the strategy for vaccination, similar to what Dr. Johnson has uh, pointed out when you're dealing with children, you want to avoid this severe, these severe illnesses. Next slide, please. Now this uh, report came out in the end of September uh, I believe it was the 22nd issue of MMWR from the CDC. And may I have the next slide, please? And in this particular study, the CDC uh, looked at 598 pregnant women who were hospitalized with the coronavirus 
uh, between March and August uh, of this past year. Um, of the 445 live births for this group, 12.6 were premature, which is defined as delivery before 37 weeks. And the rate is about 25% higher than the rate of premature births for the general population. Of the live births, 23.1% of the symptomatic women and only 8% of the asymptomatic women uh, experienced this. Uh, two of these live born babies died and both were born as symptomatic women who required mechanical ventilation. And unfortunately, two mothers in this group died in the hospital, again, who were symptomatic. The CDC report said that about half of the pregnant women who were symptomatic when they were admitted to the hospital, and among that group, 16.2% went to the ICU and 8.5% required um, mechanical ventilation. In the, in the asymptomatic group of patients who, who acted as the control, uh, we saw none of these manifestations. And severe illness and adverse birth outcomes were observed among hospitalized pregnant women with COVID-19. And again, reinforcing the need to consider vaccination. Next slide, please. Now, the most telling to me statistic from this study um, and I'm, I'm going to preface this by saying about a month before, there was data that came from the United Kingdom. And that data showed that um, one in 20 uh, patients who were admitted you know, in this reproductive age population who were admitted to hospitals um, were, were pregnant. One fifth of, of the women who had COVID, of all women in that age group, were pregnant. And in the CDC data, it was even higher, one quarter. Actually 26.5% of women ages 15 to 49 years were hospitalized with COVID were pregnant. Now, at any given time, it's estimated that roughly around 5% of the women of, in this age group would be pregnant. And so you realize we're really talking about a disproportionately higher rate of COVID infection um, in this age group compared to non, the non-pregnant women of a similar age. And we saw a similar distribution of the uh, severity of illness. As, as I mentioned before, when we're looking at those requiring hospitalization, um, it increased with trimester, the bulk of the patients being in the third trimester. And we also looked at the need for ICU admission, uh, again, mechanical ventilation and death, all of which were elevated in that group. If you wanna look at the, um, uh, what group uh, of uh, the ethnicity or the, or, the, or the race, if you will, um, of these patients who are hospitalized, 42.5% uh, uh, were of Hispanic origin. Um, and 26.5 were of uh, the, the uh, black population uh, in, this, in this age group. And um, again, it follows uh, what we do know about these groups often uh, are, are associated with uh, uh, more adverse outcomes for a variety of reasons, including underlying medical uh, conditions and social determinants uh, of health. May I have the next slide, please? So more than one quarter of hospitalized women of reproductive age who had COVID-19 were pregnant and were at greater risk for severe illness, preterm birth, and other adverse pregnancy outcomes. And for this reason, I want to enlist all of you in the audience, whether you take care of pregnant women, but if you encounter reproductive age women, please, uh, I'll go on and, and, and amplify our, our wishes, and I say our wishes, I'm speaking of the American College of OBGYN, uh, the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine, and the Association of Reproductive uh, Medicine, which is our infertility group from the ASRM. May I have the next slide, please? So right now, these are the recommendations that are coming from ACOG. They've changed the wording if you go back a number of months ago when I gave this talk, uh, 
the, the wording was people should be offered the vaccination. Now the American College is recommending that pregnant individuals be vaccinated. And, and for the American College to come out uh, with that change is a pretty strong endorsement. Now I want to emphasize that there is no evidence of adverse maternal or fetal effects from vaccinating pregnant individuals uh, with these vaccines. And I'm speaking about the mRNA vaccine specifically, uh, but we can apply the same thing to the J&J &J vaccine, which is uh, still available in the United States. And this body of data is growing. These are extremely safe vaccines and extraordinarily effective. We see the same level of effectiveness whether a patient is pregnant or not uh, who receive this, uh, receive the vaccine. And the other good news is we're having an increasing body of knowledge because there's been multiple reports now, multiple studies showing that the antibodies, uh, specifically the IgG antibodies have been demonstrated across the placenta. And now you can detect them in the uh, fetal blood following vaccination or natural infection. And, um, but the levels are much higher from vaccination. Vaccination gives you a more predictable immunologic response, which appears now to be transferred to the baby, therefore creating what we call passive immunity, which is highly desirable because we don't have vaccines for neonates and, and, and for children under, uh, under uh, in, in this age group. May I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> Clearly when counseling patients about this, yes, we have to look at the risk of exposure. <clears throat> what is the context of the individual uh, patient's uh, health? And let's talk about the community they live in. Uh, so these conversations have to be discussed, but I can tell you, you can search long and search hard. You're not gonna find a good reason not to vaccinate a patient. May I have the next slide, please. We have the same good news in lactation. Recent studies have demonstrated that the antibodies, IgG and IgA, uh, are present in breast milk and may be beneficial to the neonates. And when I talk to my colleagues in pediatrics, obviously it's gonna take a little bit longer uh, to prove um, uh, this recommendation, but the data is very, very encouraging. And there is no reason uh, that a lactating individual should not be vaccinated. And there is no reason that you should hold off or interrupt the vaccination sequence uh, if a patient is lactating. And uh, the theoretical concerns regarding the safety of vaccinating lactating individuals do not outweigh the benefits uh, of, of receiving the vaccine and avoiding severe symptomatic disease. Next slide, please. There's also a lot of mythology and I'm, I'm going to attribute that to the, you know, the, the internet. Um, there, there are people that have uh, unsupported theories, and there are people that uh, I think their motivation is malicious, are, are putting uh, information out there that is in fact not true. Um, if a woman's considering getting pregnant and she's planning to get pregnant or she's undergoing infertility treatment, we still want to vaccinate them. There is no reason not, not to. <clears throat> There is no proven uh, infertility. I'll, I'll cover that in the next slide, please. Um, most of these claims of infertility are unfounded and there's no evidence supporting it. Uh, recent studies, again, came out from the ASRM. Uh, and again, based on the studies that have been done to date, uh, there is no demonstrable infertility in either the women or in the male. Okay, and when you look at the mechanism of action and how these mRNA vaccines generate an antibody response, um, there's no reason to suspect physiologically that it would cause infertility. Um, the most important thing is that these vaccines are not mutagenic. And it's something that patients are concerned about. Okay, the, 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 these vaccines are not causing or altering uh, changes in DNA. And um, we, we have now, again, strongly tried to debunk this mythology. And I urge you all to read more on this subject and uh, because you may be getting questions from the patients that you encounter. 
Now, you may have heard about the anecdotal reports linking menstrual irregularities following the COVID-19 vaccination, but to date, they've been unsupported by scientific evidence. This is strictly testimonials, and, um, and which, as you know, is one of the lowest forms of evidence. Um, a recent study found no link between the vaccines and, 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 and menstrual function. However, the question is currently being uh, uh, funded by NIH, um, looking um, a little more closely uh, at um, menstrual calendars and, and, and irregularity uh, to, to further try to support uh, what the current hypothesis is. You know, women have irregular menses for a variety of reasons that may occur you know, during the course of any year. And uh, it's all too easy to attribute it to some event uh, that is temporally related, such as a vaccine or, you know, something else that may happen in their life. And so we need to have better evidence. Next slide, please. So I'd like to introduce uh, our, our final speaker, uh, Dr. Kate Mullane, uh, talking about another very interesting area of scientific inquiry, and that's the mixing and mac matching of vaccination boosters. Thanks very much for inviting me. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. So is the concept of giving heterologists or different vaccines one after another new? Well, of course not. It's been in play for a long time. First studies were done in the early 1980s in animals. And then um, those who like to play um, self-inoculation games, Daniel Zaguri from um, Paris, um, gave himself different forms of the H HIV um, vaccines and found a, a better immune response. Um, and then um, some vaccine uh, studies were done um, in non-human primates um, at looking at different um, uh, forms of uh, subunit versus live recombinant vaccines and showed that um, the heterologist uh, vaccines gave a much higher immune response than uh, homologous vac uh, vaccination alone. Next slide, please. So what are some reasons and rationale that we might consider doing heterologous uh, vaccination? Um, just to remember that right now over um, 7 um, billion doses of COVID vaccines have been administered worldwide. So safety is uh, pretty um, well known and it's on all of the vaccines. Um, right now, there's about 30 million doses being given per day. 49% of the world's population has received at least one dose, except in underserved countries like Africa. And in the US, 66.1% um, have had at least one vaccine, um, with 56.9% being fully vaccinated. So right now, when we look at the number of people vaccinated in the United States, it's almost 200 million people. Um, why would we consider um, giving a heterologist vaccination for um, SARS-CoV-2? Well, there have been some unacceptable toxicities with some of the vaccines. So looking at the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine with its thromboembolic events, bleeding and thrombocytopenia, um, many countries have stopped using it. There's also um, issues sometimes of vaccine shortages or unpredictability of supply. Um, and storage issues, which may not be a problem as we see now going forward with some of the vaccines. Um, what are some of the rationale for giving us um, a heterologous vaccines? Well, we are, we are seeing breakthrough vaccines with the current um, COVID infections, and that's the whole idea of boosting. Um, we know that um, inactivated subunit and recombinant envelope glycoproteins can elicit neutralizing antibodies but they're not so good at giving us cytotoxic T cell responses. Um, the recombinant vaccines uh, elicit good T cell responses, but they're not so good at giving us protective antibodies. So looking at both of those arms of the immune system, giving a heterologous um, vaccine may be uh, reasonable um, going forward. Um, and so um, this is as well supported by the World Health Organization, um, not just for COVID, but for other vaccines as well. Next slide, please. Um, so the first heterologist endo, uh, vaccine that was seen was the Russian one. So Sputnik V, as you know, is um, recombinant endovirus 26, followed by a boost or a, a secondary vaccine with recombinant endovirus 5. 
and um, the adenovirus carries the gene, the spike gene. And um, the first vaccine, uh, this was the first vaccine that was registered for use um, in any nation. It's not EMA approved, not World Health Organization approved, but um, initially it was approved in Russia on 76 patients, which led to a lot of concerns, um, which were voiced by the scientific and ethics communities. Um, and even so, um, even before the phase two and a half and three data was out, it's been approved in 67 countries for use. Next slide. They finally did come out with some of their data, um, the, at least the interim analysis um, for looking at efficacy with this um, heterologous vaccine. Uh, this is a double blind placebo controlled three to one randomized clinical trial. It's in phase three. They looked at um, people over 18 years old and it was um, 1,600 uh, or 60,000 patients got the vaccine and um, 5,000 got the placebo. Patients had to have a negative uh, antibody test beforehand and a negative PCR, and they were stratified by age. So did the prime boost regimen with a 20 to eight day or 21 day interval uh, between the doses. And they looked at outcomes um, after the second dose. But because it's still early in the study, it was only about 48 days after dose one or 24 days after dose two. Even so, with this early data, they saw a vaccine efficacy of 91.6%, but we don't know anything about the durability. The good thing that they saw, as you can see um, in the uh, blue and pink um, chart, is by age, very good immune response in all age groups. And then in the bottom slide, we can see um, the um, interferon gamma release, which um, the stimulation was very good. Um, there were two patients that had no response at all, but overall it showed a very nice immune response. Next slide. Um, in other countries, the Combavac study has been looked at, and this is um, giving mRNA post the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, they looked at persons less than 60 years old who got um, the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine um, dose at least uh, eight weeks before. Um, then they were dosed with uh, the Pfizer dose in a two to one randomization. And they found that um, they saw high immunogenicity um, when this combination was given. So the antibody titers rose from 82 units to 3,430 units after seven days um, from vaccination. And they saw sevenfold higher neutralization uh, antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. Um, the adverse events were not much different than the initial dose um, um, and not different compared to giving homo homologous uh, vaccination or giving a follow-up of the um, uh, AstraZeneca vaccine. So um, looking at this, um, you can see that there's a very nice antibody um, response and as well, um, a very nice interferon gamma response compared to uh, the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine alone. Next slide. In Denmark, they use their entire population as a study group. Um, they stopped using the AstraZeneca vaccine and followed it in all their, their recommendations with an mRNA boost. So they have 5 million people in Denmark. Um, initially, they used all. They offered all three vaccines, but in um, April they stopped using the AstraZeneca vaccine, and then those individuals were offered a dose of mRNA vaccine. Um, they followed um, 144,000 people who were vaccinated. Um, 136,000 received the mRNA vaccine as a second dose, um, with most of them getting or higher percentage getting the Pfizer vaccine. Um, than the Moderna vaccine. And they saw vaccine efficacy of um, 66 to 88% from day 14 after the second dose of vaccine. Um, if they looked at one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine, the va vaccine efficacy was only um, 29 to 44%. And um, with the uh, heterologous boost, there were no hospitalizations and no deaths. Next slide. Um, in France, they looked at healthcare workers who had gotten the um, AstraZeneca vaccine. 
um, versus those who got um, the initial uh, Pfizer vaccine and then did either heterologous or homologous bo boosting. And they found that those that got heterologous vaccination had a very much stronger um, display of neutralizing antibodies um, compared to those um, that um, had the um, homogenous uh, vaccination with AstraZeneca. And um, they saw that the heterologous group had a lower incidence of COVID overall. Next slide. Um, and looking at the immunogenicity um, in these groups, you can see that the um, two dose of um, Pfizer vaccine compared to those getting a uh, AstraZeneca vaccine followed by a Pfizer vaccine had very similar outcomes in their antibody titers, um, both in um, neutralizing antibodies and in receptor binding um, domain specific memory cells, um, B memory cells and T cells. Next slide. So um, it looks like the heterologous uh, regimens are much more effective than two doses of AstraZeneca. Um, and this study was just published in Lancet that evaluated in England the efficacy of homologous uh, versus heterologous vaccines. Um, and um, they looked at, um, sorry, it was done in Sweden. Um, they looked at um, their national registry, which had the vaccination history of all their um, residents and they compared um, 500,000 patients who were vaccinated compared to 180,000 of those who were not vaccinated. And they saw that those who got mixed vaccinations had um, much better um, likelihood or vaccine efficacy um, with uh, the heterologist versus the homologous um, vaccine. So if you were heterologous uh, vaccine, it was 68% less likely to develop a symptomatic infection um, versus 50% in those who were um, homogenous. Um, next slide, please. Um, the COVPN network here in the United States actually looked at nine combinations of um, boosting. Um, they looked at anybody who had gotten an EUA vaccine more than 12 weeks before enrollment, who had no reported history of COVID. They got uh, 458 subjects um, who had gotten either um, mRNA 1273, the Pfizer, which is Moderna, the Pfizer vaccine, or AstraZeneca. And then they gave them a boost with a different vaccine. So there were nine different combinations, um, three times three. And um, they looked at primary outcomes of safety, efficacy, reactogenicity, um, meaning side effects and um, immune responses. And they saw that those who got homologous um, boosts had increased in their neutralizing antibodies from four to 20 fold, where those that had heterologous boosts had increased in their neutralizing antibodies um, six to 76 fold. Next slide. So um, you can see um, in B and E especially, these are um, people who got boosted with the AstraZeneca vaccine, or sorry, um, the J&J &J vaccine. So if you look at um, the first bar in B and E, those are people who got both J&J um, &J for their initial and their boost. And you don't see much of a change in their neutralizing antibodies or in their interferon gamma response. However, if those patients got an mRNA vaccine following their J&J um, &J vaccine, they had almost the same response rate as people who had gotten two doses of um, an mRNA vaccine. And so many people would say it's probably better um, to get a um, mRNA dose after a J&J &J initial vaccination and not another J&J &J vaccination, but um, still the efficacy is over 90% in those patients who got a boost with the J&J &J vaccine. So when we look at all of our vaccines, um, they're all very effective. And um, overall, we're very lucky in having um, this level of vaccine efficacy with all the products that are available to us. Um, next slide. So um, conclusions, this is always changing. Um, we were talking earlier that 
We used to say it's going to change in a week. Sometimes it changes in a day. It appears that the adenovirus vaccines are best boosted with an mRNA vaccine, um, although it's still effective to get um, the adenovirus vaccine as a boost. Um, and um, it looks like there's probably benefit in using both platforms in that you may get a better cell mediated immunity um, resulting from um, giving heterologous vaccines. And I think that's it. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Katie. Uh, there were several questions. One question was simultaneous vaccination for children, influenza vaccine and other vaccines and putting it in into the mix. So Dan, can you address that? Yeah, there's uh, no need to wait uh, to give uh, uh, any of the vaccines with the uh, uh, COVID vaccine. So said another way, you can give the COVID vaccine at the same time, you can give it uh, days before and then give a COVID vaccine, you can give the COVID vaccine and give the other vaccines afterwards, uh, uh, days or weeks later. It, there's, there's no requirement uh, to change the timing of any vaccine in relationship to the COVID vaccines. And then the site of vaccination, I know it says muscular uh -huh. on, on the packaging. So I just wanted you to reiterate, you know, that about the sites of vaccine for children. Yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Uh, the recommendation uh, for the five to 11 year olds was to give it in the deltoid. Uh, there's nothing wrong with giving it in the thigh, uh, uh, but the recommendation was to give it in the deltoid. They did say, that if you're going to give more than one vaccine at a time, you should not use the same deltoid. Uh, and that's because, particularly in the kids who are younger, uh, there isn't a lot of deltoid there. Uh, and so the concern is, is that uh, you would end up uh, giving the vaccine uh, too close together. Uh, you know, there's no data that actually says one way or the other. Uh, so they said, give it in opposite deltoids if you're giving more than one vaccine, uh, or uh, give it in a leg uh, if you're giving more than one vaccine, but preferably to use the deltoid for vaccination because that's what was used in the study. And then there's a question about, are we encouraging women of reproductive age to get mRNA vaccines rather than J&J? &J? So uh, Katie, can you take that question? Oh, I was going to say Dr. Lynch for pregnancy. Oh, Dr. Lynch, yeah. Dr. Lynch, it doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm going to give you the scientific answer first, and there's no reason to avoid the J&J &J vaccine. And my personal recommendation, we would go with an mRNA vaccine, because I still think there's a uh, been proven to have a, a stronger uh, immunologic response. So Dr. Milan, you may disagree with me if you, if you choose. No, I agree. And I just wanted to add with for Dan, you know, when we do these big clinical trials, um, looking at, at vaccine efficacy and you enroll, you know, 44,000 in our Pfizer trial, 30,000 in the Moderna trial, um, 40,000 in the J&J &J trial, you always want people to not get their vaccine for a month to separate everything out, but patients are patients. And they go ahead and do it anyway. And so I could tell you that there were many of the patients that did get um, a vaccine when they weren't supposed to, close to their COVID vaccine. And there, there wasn't any problems. So I think um, you know, we can feel kind of safe with that, knowing that. The only thing that, that I think is um, something to think about is that um, in case of allergies or things like that, it might be at this point in time until we know more um, and for safety um, data to separate them out. But that's the scientist thinking of me. The mom would say, give them all at once because I don't want to traumatize my child all these, time, all these times going in and out. But um, I would be the mom that would wait till he was asleep at night and sneak up on him with a needle. Um, and so <laughs> you wake up going, how come my arm hurts? But no, um, that's the, um, you know, I think um, as a scientist, I still think it would be the, the child studies weren't as big as the adult studies and it would be nice to have a little bit better idea of what the adverse events are. There's a question about myocarditis in, in a family history of 
in, in people with a family history of heart of, uh, of, of uh, cardiac disease. Uh, and does a family with history of cardiac disease impact risk for myocarditis and pericarditis in children five to 11 is the question, Dan. Well, I would say that uh, there's no uh, argument that I can come up with as to why uh, heart disease in an adult in a household would have implications for a five to 11 year old, unless you know that there was a genetic syndrome associated with it. There was a genetic syndrome associated with it, then I would advise the family to have a conversation with the, uh, the child's cardiologist if it turns out that the child carries the same gene and it happens to be a clinical syndrome that can present in childhood. I'm not aware of those, but that's not my area of expertise. Um, so I would say that realistically, there's probably nothing uh, that I, I would uh, be concerned about. Um, but, you know, there are syndromes I don't know anything about. And then the last question, any information on the risk of breakthrough code with two-shot mRNA va vaccinations versus adding on a booster? And I think this is the reason why they're adding on a booster. Um, the booster doses are controversial in the vaccinology world, but it does for a short period of time, increase your, um, your neutralizing antibodies and, you know, and, and your, um, and your um, B cell, your, your, your immunoglobulins. So you have specific, you actually decrease the amount of nasal carriage for a short period of time, but it's a short period of time. We're trying to get through the winter here, I think. This is fundamentally the reason why we're giving boosters. So um, on that note, if you have more questions, we'll be happy to answer them later. Can I, can I just say too, for, we sure know thing. for like the Delta variant, it took about seven fold higher antibodies to protect us from that and um, as well with mu. And so I think having higher antibody titers is gonna be important as Dr. Chandi said through the winter to make sure that um, if we're closer together and if we're near these, um, these viruses that um, do require higher levels of neutralizing antibodies that we are protected. There is one question about Sputnik, uh, which is, and then getting, is it okay to boost with a and j I really think that you should get an mRNA vaccine if you've got a Sputnik vaccine, because now you've got the best of both worlds. Uh, Katie, you just want to... So um, the adenovirus 26 is the exact same one that's in um, the J&J &J vaccine. So it would be essentially doing a second J&J &J vaccine, and we know that we get a better immune response if we give a um, messenger RNA after the adenovirus 26. And so, um, you know, I, I think that um, I agree with Dr. Chandi, I would recommend um, that you give something different that's gonna really boost the immune system. Very good. The other question of... that's coming up now more frequently is China. What do we do with those people? And we know that um, the killed virus vaccines that are coming from China are not very effective at all, maybe in the range of 30%. And in those patients, you may want to just consider redoing the entire vaccine series um, because, um, or at least two doses of mRNA afterwards, um, because we know that they're not very immun immunogenic and they're not very durable. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, and that's exactly the Chinese vaccines do not work. In reality, they would not have been approved. And, and, and so you should revaccinate for those vaccines. So very good. Thank you very thank you very much for all the participants. Thank you very much for Dr. Johnson, Dr. Lynn, and Dr. Mullane for all your help. Uh, and hopefully we'll continue this series as needed. So have a good night, everyone.